And next year, our final guest will have been in the music industry for 50 years. He's regarded as the original British rock and roll guitar legend. And tomorrow he releases his first solo album for something like five years. But behind his half century of success lies a deep faith as a Jehovah's Witness. He's going to be playing for us live very shortly. But I'm delighted to say he's here. It is, of course, Hank Marvin. Hello, How well, are you, Hank? to see you again. Very nice mm. to see you as well. My goodness, 50 years next year. It's scary, Man and boy. How, how do you feel about that? It doesn't seem that long. It really doesn't. You know, looking back, obviously, a lot of things have happened. However, it just doesn't seem 50 years, not at all. Will you celebrate your 50th anniversary? Well, we'd like to do something, but we don't know what yet. Um, lots of fans ask. We've had lots of promoters asking if we're going to do something special, but there's nothing planned at the moment. You have to do something. Well, I'll tell you what, I've, I've always been very interested uh, with you in particular, because you, you, of course, had the whole Cliff and the Shadows period. Yeah. And then the Shadows had enormous success, naturally enough, all through that, really. Um, in their own right. And then Hank Marvin emerged as a great solo artist. How have you managed, in, in a way, to balance that and to retain the independence? Uh, independence, uh, you mean balance with working with the Shads and well, the Cliff and that sort of thing? Well, you've always retained your independence, like yeah. a, away from, say, the strong stamp, even with Cliff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose even from through the 60s, once we started having success on our own, uh, whilst we had that independence, we were doing our own tours, we nevertheless still had the relationship with Cliff that uh, the public enjoyed, and we enjoyed it too. So we did a lot of tours with Cliff, a lot of recordings, and uh, someone was asked me the other day about the relationship we had, and, and they, they wondered if it was like a singer and a backing band, and it was never like that. From day one, it was like a five-piece band, so there was a very close mateship with us, which was terrific through the years, but and it's been good that I've been at all... Uh, the shadows went off on their own, did things, and can get back. That I've gone off and done things on my own, and from time to time, all of us get back together, reunite. Well, that's the fabulous thing because I, mm. I saw you actually at the Palladium when, in fact, um, he came and joined you and stayed yes. uh, in in your show. Yeah. So I like the way you've been able to intermix that all over the years. Um, it brings me to um, the point of religion, of course, because you become a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Um, Cliff, in his early days, got a lot of criticism when he became a born-again Christian. Did the two of you, when you were together a lot, did you talk a lot about religion? We did in the early days because I was studying the Bible at that point and researching things. And I think Cliff was in a similar situation. So it's natural that we should share what we were learning and debate certain things or just share them, really, and, and, and compare the beliefs that we had or the beliefs that we were beginning to have. Yes. So, so what was it then that, that made you decide to, jo to be a Jehovah's Witness? Well, nothing really made me. Uh, I was an atheist pretty much until I started looking into God's Word. And the th one thing that struck me about God's Word is the, is the historicity of the book. You know, there's, there's a lot of time and place and, and dating that you can, you can uh, work out because of certain people were in power at a time. So there's a lot of uh, definite, almost legal stuff in there as regards putting a place, a time, or whatever on it. And I find that was very interesting. And other things appeal to me, too. I found out that God had a name, um, that the name Jehovah is in the, the Hebrew Scriptures over 7,000 times in the original manuscripts. And I thought that's important. You know, we as individuals have names, and we usually get to know each other by our name. And to me, that was an important factor to realize that uh, there's this loving God who has a name, has a purpose, and that's something I related to. But what, what, what was it about the faith as such that, that attracted you to be a Jehovah's Witness as opposed to join any other church and study the Bible? Well, I suppose one thing was the, was the name. No one else was using the name for whatever reason they choose not to. Uh, and also, as I say, with research I was doing, study, I, I was interested in the way the, uh, the faith was structured, if, if you like, the organization. It's an organization of preachers, as were the first century Christians, and we, have, uh, we don't have any paid uh, ministers. Um, every individual is considered a minister, although we do have bodies of elders in the congregation who are qualified or appointed according to their qualifications that are laid out in the scriptures yeah. in, in God's Word. So that, that's how that works. And they're, they're men who give their time freely. Often they're working men, like most of us are. They've got a family to support. Things like that intrigued me and interested me. You see, I'm not going to ask you about the door-to-door -door connotation that Jehovah's Witness has, but how do you then, and according to your faith, spread your faith or spread the word when, say, if you're in Australia or here? Well, sometimes we get the chance to discuss with people informally. You know, people often are intrigued by what we stand for, what we believe. 
But the, the main thrust of our preaching is through the door-to-door -door work. It's, it's a, it was done in the first century, and it's, it's very effective, uh, an effective way of contacting people. Obviously, not everyone we meet is interested. Uh, we meet a lot of apathy. And sadly, a lot of people are just not interested in any kind of religion any longer. They're just, it's all materialism. And you still actively talk to people? Oh, yes. Yeah, on yes. the doorstep? Definitely, Do you? yes. Well, yeah. well, in both countries? Uh, yes, if yes. I get the time when I'm here. I'm not here mm. that often, so it's usually a, a, a whistle-stop trip. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is whistle-stop, as you say, and uh, you are going to be playing at the end of the program. So yes. just tell me what you're going to play. And, of course, you've got your son Ben as well. Yes, Ben's, uh, Ben's with me today. In fact, the tune we're going to play is one of Ben's compositions. It's from my new album, which is an album mainly of interpretations of recognisable hits like You're Beautiful, Here, There and Everywhere, which, just very quickly, in 1965, Paul McCartney came into Abbey Road to the Shads with a piece of music he wanted to play us. And he said, I'd love you to record this. He played the tune. And he promised to send it in on a cassette, which he didn't do. A few months later, it appeared on the new Beatles album, Revolver, as the song Here, There and Everywhere. So 47 years later, it's on this album. You get a chance uh, to do yeah. it. <laughs> now, this tune is an, is an acoustic version of the tune on the album. It's called Summer House. Well, we look forward to hearing it very much. Hank, thank, thank you, you very much indeed it's for joining pleasure. us. Hank Marvin, so it's goodbye from all of us in Manchester. Bye-bye.